Welcome to Good Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Hex. And I'm Barjo. And welcome back to the Den of Gaming, Hex. It was wonderful to see what you got up to last week at E3, but it's even better to have you back. Oh, thanks. E3 was exhausting, but such a phenomenal experience. What was your pick from the conference? I think I'd have to say Skyrim. I mean, it's just massive, filled with random events, and you can interact with everything. You can battle dragons and absorb their souls, Barjo. Oh, it's going to steal so much of my life. The other game that I thought was interesting, which we didn't really get to talk about in the E3 special, was the new Tomb Raider game, which isn't going to be out until the end of 2012. This kind of followed a very uncharted style of gameplay. Now, this is an origin story. It's a younger, more inexperienced Lara. She's 21, not the ass-kicking Tomb Raider that we're used to, but she gets knocked around a lot. It's, mm. it's a little bit weird at times. What about the Wii U? It's it's an awkward looking controller. Was it comfy to hold? Well, I mean, it, it was comfy. It's just quite big and cumbersome. But I mean, I like the fact that you'll be able to switch from playing on a screen seamlessly to playing with the handheld. And I, I enjoy the way they tried to incorporate all the multiplayer elements. All the Wii peripherals will be backwards compatible with the Wii U too, which is great for people who have spent that much money on them over the years. I have to say though, too, props to those guys that demo the games. I mean, especially at the press conferences, it's so much pressure. Thousands of people. Can you imagine if you just missed a sniper or something and you died. How humiliating. Speaking of people playing games and talking about them, we've been catching up on the latest releases. We'll return to the weirdness of Wonderland with Alice Madness Returns. And Sucker Punch Developed Infamous 2 gets the rubber chicken treatment. Plus, Bajo, I think it's time we wrapped up the debate in the Call of Duty series with fanboys versus haters. I agree, Hex, but first, can you guess the game for this week? I wanted some time to think, to figure out what to do with my life. You know, Bajo, I haven't thanked you for something. What? Thank you for reviewing We Dare while I was out of the country. I, you know, I have no words. Mm, you owe me. Uh, go read the news. Cannot be unseen. Good game. The legal battle between Activision and Call of Duty Modern Warfare creators Jason West and Vincent Zampella is likely to go to trial. The widely publicised case began last year when West and Zampella were fired by Activision, leading them to file for a lawsuit claiming wrongful termination and over $125 million in missing payments. A Los Angeles Superior Court judge has found there is sufficient evidence to support the allegations and if an out-of-court settlement is not reached, the case could go to trial by the end of the year. THQ has closed Chaos Studios, developer of the first-person shooter Homefront. Against the wall! You. You have forced us to examine your dedication. The studio had already suffered 17 layoffs earlier this year, but the remaining 70 staff have now been let go. Take him away! THQ's Montreal studio will be taking control of Homefront, while an unspecified number of staff from Chaos Studios will move to Montreal to continue to work on the franchise. <laughs> State officials have approved a $1.8 billion tax plan, which will help encourage investment in Australian technology companies, including those involved in the games industry. You offering me a deal. As of July, companies with a turnover of less than $20 million will receive a 45% refundable tax credit, while all others will receive a 40% non-refundable offset. I get the message. How much is this going to cost me? 2K Games, the publisher of Duke Nukem Forever, has fired its public relations agent, the Redner Group, following a tweet from their official account. Graves wants me to help you jack these motherfuckers up, just like old fucking times. Can't wait to pound them in the cornhole. hoo -ah! The tweet essentially said the agency would blacklist any publications which published venom-filled reviews of Duke Nukem Forever and that future review copies of games may not be sent to those outlets. 2K Games quickly responded on their own official Twitter, stating that they did not endorse such comments and that the Redner PR group would no longer be representing them. Gaming websites and services continue to be attacked by hackers. The hacks have largely been carried out by a group calling themselves LOLSEC, who claim to target sites just for the LOLs. However, their modus operandi typically includes stealing user data such as usernames and passwords and then posting the information online. Recently, the group has successfully attacked Sega, Minecraft, EVE Online, Bethesda, Epic, Nintendo, Bioware and Sony. The group has also attacked high-profile non-gaming targets including the CIA and an FBI affiliate in the United States Senate. A crash in sky. The silver screen adaptation of Gears of War is in development hell and may never happen, according to series designer Cliff Blazinski. The film was announced in 2007 and was planned to be released last year. However, shooting has yet to commence while the project has lost its director, undergone multiple script rewrites, as well as having the budget slashed. 
Blazinski is hopeful the film will eventually be completed, but has said that he would rather not have a movie than a movie that sucks. Good game. I was someone you'd never notice. Just a guy delivering packages to folks he'd never know. And then one day, the package found me. Infamous gave us a brand new video game superhero. A normal courier transformed into a building leaping, electricity wielding maniac. Forced to choose between good and evil and racked with guilt from the thousands killed by the explosion that gave him his powers. It was a top origin story for Cole. So what does Infamous 2 hold for? A beast is coming. A monster only I can defeat. A powerful Cole returns to Empire City to take down the beast. Provided that I am strong and ready to face him. Who has been terrorizing the country, leaving only destruction in its path. don't quite go to plan and Cole is left weaker than before. Retreating to New Marais to track down the origin of his powers with the help of some friends, Cole sets out to toughen himself up before the beast reaches the city. It's a common trick in games, especially sequels, to start you out very powerful and then strip away all those abilities suddenly and slowly drip feed them back to you throughout the game. Sometimes it's really annoying, such as in some of the God of War games, but it really worked here. They didn't take away all of your abilities and they kind of lessened some, so you're not completely gimped and you don't have to reclaim all those power nodes. Acquiring the new abilities is genuinely fun. Mm, it definitely works. To unlock new powers, you'll need to do a variety of things, from completing side missions to particular enemy takedowns and choosing to be good or evil will unlock more abilities as well. Challenges are quite fun to keep in the back of your mind. I liked the searching missions and the don't touch the ground races, but there is a lot here that's quite similar to the first game. Such as the good and evil powers, I would have liked more diversity in those. You do pay for going back on your chosen path, so it's important to stick with good or evil or you'll be set back a bit. Yeah, I was happily playing the bastard and then I went back on one choice and suddenly I was back at square one all over again. There were a few should I, shouldn't I moments in there though and I liked those. And I never tired of silencing street performers. I also felt some of the abilities were a bit wasted. Like the pincer bolt, I found no reason to ever use that. And also some of the blasts were just impractical in the busy fight, so you didn't really get time to be creative. But there's nothing like hurling an ionic vortex into a helicopter. I enjoyed unlocking the parkour abilities the most because once you get the glide, which takes way too long, and then the ice jump, the whole system becomes much more fluid. There's also a Spider-Man-like electricity grapple which gets you around the place, but you can't really string them together, so you just end up going with the ice jump and the glide. I love the ice jump hicks. Mm. I actually quite liked that you couldn't fall off anything. That subtle guide that Cole does to help you get onto rails and wires was excellent, I thought. Although I did find myself wanting a, a let go button that you could just hold down. Mm. Often when you're trying to get down off a building, you'll automatically grab something and have to mash circle to let go. This movement system sacrifices fluidness for control for the better, I thought. It doesn't take much to take Cole down, but I didn't mind that vulnerability. It's quite fun searching for that flicker of electricity to suck back in some life. I still enjoy this mechanic, Hex, and all of the fighting, especially the bigger fights in the city, where you have all those enemies becoming friends on screen to take down a giant foe. Big ass, filthy mole monsters. But looking back, I wasn't a fan of the bulk of the missions. There's a few good ones there, but most of them are just a bit uninspired. Our medical supplies were confiscated. We'll have to close the clinic if you can't get them back. Especially towards the end, they start to get drawn out and repeat themselves. One in particular where you have to lift up this lid and then move it to another location and put it on top of a flaming hole. And you have to do that three or four times and sometimes it lands in the water and you have to stand on it and pick it up while you're in the water then jump out. It's just really tedious. Yeah, I suppose the missions did run out of steam a bit towards the end. I did enjoy fighting all the ice dudes in the last act, even though Flood Town was a pretty annoying location considering coal can't touch water. It was nice having a different location though. Infamous 2 is one of the best looking open world games out there, but it also doesn't look very much different from the first. And I think that stems from this game being more of a continuation from the first game as opposed to a true sequel. And that hurts it, I think. Why couldn't it have been a giant sprawling metropolis or just something a bit different? I felt like it was too samey, which is a shame because the mechanics of this game are really sound. 
I don't know, Bajo. I thought the story was really well told here, and I really enjoyed the cutscenes and the voice acting. Move your ass, girl! Damn, you look like hell. Subscribe, hey, Seed. You warm to Quo pretty quickly, especially after she gets kidnapped. And I liked Nick's too, the devil on your shoulder that just wants to cause mayhem. It ain't about needing help. I just want a little company. Infamous 2 also has a new user-generated content feature which allows players to remix and share their own missions. And that's a great touch for fans who want to keep on playing in this world. Although, having said that, even the biggest Infamous fan in our office admitted that he skipped them because the reward for doing them just isn't there. Like any content creator, it takes a while to master, and I spent about an hour or two with it, and this was the best I could do. Credit to the developer, though, for putting it in the game. Final thoughts? Well, aside from the late arrival of the glide power, I thought the drip feed of abilities was well managed and the improvements to the melee were welcome. There's also some fine camera work here. The subtle bobs and sways during combat combined with that slow motion make for some really exciting action. If you are a fan of the first game, then I think the story will really pull you through. So I'm giving it eight and a half out of 10 rubber chickens. I think technically it's a better game than the first one, but there wasn't anything here that made it a must have, you know? Like I felt like it needed co-op or just something new and exciting to bring me back into it. What the hell? There was this one moment halfway through, I was like, yes, I feel like a hero. And then it just kind of petered off. So I'm giving it seven and a half out of 10 rubber chickens. What you think, baby? Oh, uh, I think you're crazy. I think you like it. Good game. <laughs>
Well, it's certainly a good point. It wouldn't sell that much if it wasn't fun, would it? To be that popular, it's got to be doing something right. And Tom here explains what it is he loves. COD has given us kill cams, kill streaks, the perk system, gun customization, a rank system, unforgettable maps, trick shotting, Captain Price, cross map tomahawking, quick scoping, gaming montages, a badass community, and of course, the tactical new. Smile. Yes, well, I think we can all agree that Captain Price has one of the best moustaches in all of history. But Marjo, a few viewers took to video responses, so why don't we give them their few precious seconds of screen time? Good thinking, Hex. COD, call of disappointment. I loved, I loved Modern Warfare where you broke into the prison camp and you had the helicopters and you were flying around and shooting stuff and you had to go and break in and rescue Captain Price, who is fucking amazing. He's like my favorite character in a shooter video game ever. Every single year they release the same exact game with a different campaign and the multiplayer will be exactly the same except they'll add a couple more things just to make people like myself buy every single year. Call of Duty really is the gold standard when it comes to military FPSs, and many of the innovations of the genre have come from the evolution of this game. The mechanics are sound, and there are plenty of weapons in action. I particularly like the early historical missions and the gritty, realistic feel of the gameplay. Modern Warfare 3 is coming out this year, and I am not buying <laughs> And I'm going to buy Battlefield 3 instead because I know Battlefield 3 is going to be the winner. So if you buy Modern Warfare 3, take this word of advice, take this warning, take this action. Do not expect any good from the series. Activision is a bunch of retards. <laughs> Free headshot. Damn it, die already! Those were some quite passionate responses, weren't they? Indeed they were, Hex. And I'm loving all the animations you guys are doing, so please keep it up. But we should wrap this up with one more piece of fanboy in with this from Angus. How can you not like COD? It's the everyman's shooter with excellent graphics, heart-pumping storylines and fun scenarios. The one thing that disappoints me is that there's no destruction and that's why Battlefield has the upper hand. But besides that, it is pure freaking awesomeness! Well, it's certainly going to be a massive showdown this year between Modern Warfare 3 and Battlefield 3. And if Battlefield 3 can even make its online as good as Bad Company 2 with Jet, oh, it's going to be a pretty tough fight. <laughs> Bajo, can't you just play and enjoy them both? No. <laughs> All right, fanboys and haters, get your boxing gloves on for the next round. We want you to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sony's flagship racer, Gran Turismo. Is it sweet, streamlined simulation or dull as dishwater driving? Fight! fight! Well, actually, when I was a kid in uh, elementary school, I would play uh, moon, the Moon Rover game, the Moon Buggy, you know? Moon Patrol, that's what it was, yeah. And uh, I thought that was fantastic. And, um, you know, they had all the classic arcade machines on, on my way home from school, so I got into those, uh, you know, Defender, and Spy Hunter was, was in there at the time, and uh, uh, there was uh, Sinistar. I am Sinistar. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, this is such an immersive experience. This is so great. I mean, this this arcade machine is actually speaking to me, you know? Run, run, run. I hunger. Wow, this is like really, really intense. And now, you know, you look back on that and you think, well, what was I thinking? Beware, coward. I mean, even, you know, Doom, when we were making it, it's amazing to me now to go back and to look at Doom and you think, wow, 320 by 200. I mean, the pixels are this big. And yet, when we were making the game, it was so real. It was amazing how our minds filled in the gaps. It made me think, like, until you see the next generation, your brain is constantly filling in the information that's missing from the thing that you're seeing. So, you know, back then, Sinistar was like, wow, I'm in space being chased by this monster. And then you go to Doom and you think, well, this is this is it. This is so cutting edge. And then, you know, you move on to the next thing 
Uh, it's just, it's pretty amazing how, how far it's come. Beware, I live. American McGee's Alice, released in 2000, has become somewhat of a classic. And appropriately, the sequel takes place 11 years later with Alice Madness Returns. Alice reawakens in an English home and we learn that she's escaped from Rutledge Asylum but is still struggling to deal with some rather nightmarish hallucinations. The character of Alice is sharp and intelligent but still clearly suffering from the traumatic events of her past. Her to say, oh, died on my account, I couldn't save you. So she returns to Wonderland in hopes of finally uncovering the truth. But Wonderland is not as she remembers it and evil is taking over. Appearances, as you know better than most, can be deceiving, Alice. Much has changed since your last visit. Straight away you'll be struck by the gorgeous art and design that the last game was so well known for. Once you leave the murky shadows of dreary grey reality, you're sent hurtling through a series of varied and gorgeous levels. The steampunk-inspired Mad Hatter realm that you visit early on was one of my favourites, I think. Character animation isn't that great, but the landscapes and settings are quite well done. Mm. I love that real-world Alice is rather haggard and sullen-looking, whereas Wonderland Alice is kind of her in her idealised form. And each different area of Wonderland you'll visit will see her change into an appropriately themed outfit. I can just see the cosplayers madly planning her various incarnations already. And once again, she has her trusty Vorpal Blade at the ready to hack apart her twisted foes with. The Vorpal Blade is swift and keen and always ready for service. I just really enjoyed the way this game has interpreted the psychological aspects of Alice's journey. You know, this is really what I hoped Tim Burton's film would be like. That being said, all the trailers and teasers leading up to this game made it out to be a lot darker than mm. it actually is. Alice, tell me of your wonderland. There were a few ideas here and there that toyed with that darkness, but really the characters were just cute. Twisted, but cute. I totally agree. I mean, I guess some of the darker stuff was sort of hinted at in some of those narrative cutscenes. Something wrong. Something wrong? wrong. But, I mean, this is a game that's targeted at adults, so some real adult horror would have been great. Yeah, it would have been nice if they took that further. I thought that's what this game was really going for. But still, there's a dark quirkiness to it that provides a suitable setting for the action, and it's very well in keeping with the wackiness of Lewis Carroll's Wonderland. One of the main complaints about the first game was that it had some pretty dicey jumping mechanics. Here, that's thankfully been rectified, which is good news since the game is primarily comprised of platforming and jumping puzzles. Alice can jump and glide up to three times in midair, and this provides you with a really fluid, enjoyable way of making your way through each level. Sometimes it can be hard to judge distances, and it's really about setting up that right camera angle before taking the leap. Alice can also make herself tiny at any point, and this allows you to fit through small keyhole doors to hidden rooms that contain fragments of Alice's lost memories. While you're in tiny mode, you can't jump or fight, but it does reveal hidden markings, doors, and secret platforms. Trying to navigate across platforms you can't actually see is pretty crazy. And it's quite possibly the coolest hint system I've ever seen in a game too. Whenever you're stuck for what to do next, just enter Tiny Alice mode and you'll see chalk drawings, clues and arrows scrolled across the walls pointing you towards a little bonus get or the next room. There are clever clues to alert you of when to use it too. For example, these flowers which give up health and XP require you to get Tiny to use them. Once you do that, you'll notice a whole series of hidden platforms there. Alice collects teeth, which she gets by killing enemies and also smashing level-themed crates. And you use these to upgrade your weapons. Alice's Vorpal Blade is her fast, close combat weapon, and she's got a hobby horse, which can club enemies as a slower, heavier attack. In the first game, Alice would throw her blade as a ranged attack, but here she has a pepper grinder. It has a cooldown, so you can't just spam your way through it. And finally, the Umbrella Shield. 
that was surprisingly sophisticated, I thought. I mean, it's not spammy at all, and you really need to switch up your attacks to take down the various enemies you'll face. There are some enemies that'll really piss you off. These eye pots are really annoying at first. And there's this three-headed charging beast that you'll have to deflect their fireballs with your umbrella and then use your pepper grinder to take down each one of their heads in turn. And you get quite good at it after a while just because you face so many of them, but I can't help but feel like they just lazily chucked a few in every other room just to slow you down. Yeah. You need to make good use of Alice's dodge too, and I quite liked it, Hex, because she dissolves into a thing of butterflies. Oh. The combat and the level design is pretty classic action adventure, but it all works well, and I found myself just losing hours here, Hex. Suitably eerie soundtrack too, I thought. Rough cello chords and music box twinkles underscore each world just beautifully. And I liked the inclusion of the odd side-scrolling level to keep things interesting. I think gamers who loved the first game and the whole gothic interpretation of Alice's story but felt that it played a bit derpy will be really happy with this sequel. It's a fluid continuation that maintains American McGee's vision beautifully, but with a serious facelift to gameplay. I think we we're both just expecting something a little bit more adult from it. Mm, maybe we've just been desensitized, Tex. <laughs> I just felt like every time they went to a dark place, they just shied away from it, so that left me a little bit disappointed. But I love the language and the script here. It felt appropriately literary and proper, so I'm giving it 7.5 out of 10 robber chickens. Alice's memory fragments are quite cryptic and random, so there's some real mystery here. But this is a beautiful world with some serious detail and, and really interesting platforming, I thought. Yes, it could have been darker, but I don't think series fans will be disappointed. I'm giving it 8 out of 10 rubber chickens. We recently caught up with Alice creator American McGee, and you can see that full interview on our website. Good game! So did you guess the game for this week? Of course you did. It was the original Red Faction for PS2 and PC. You played the downtrodden miner Parker, who picked up a pistol to rebel against the big bad Altor Corporation. The game's geomod tech allowed for a certain amount of terrain deformation, which made it a bit of a hit back in 2001. Coming up on next week's show, we'll be gearing up for a click-laden loot-a-thon with Dungeon Siege 3. And, this is quite exciting, Badge, we'll be introducing you to Good Game's new razor-sharp roving reporter, Goose, and we'll find out what he has in store for us. With such a diverse range of experiences to be had in gaming, is simply slapping on a score the most accurate way to measure a game's potential? We'll have to run them through the good game initiation ritual. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to all who tweeted along with us tonight, and if you have any thoughts about the show or gaming in general, head to the Facebook or the forums pages and let us know your thoughts. Big news for younger gamers, as of this Saturday, Good Game Spawn Point will be relaunched as a half-hour show. We'll be checking out the Green Lantern game, Darren will be giving a Terraria Masterclass and loads more. So make sure you head over to ABC3 this weekend to check it out. Until then, gamers, Bajo out. Hex out. Out. <laughs> <laughs>